fusing architecture, storytelling, and technology. This is Fusion, the Electrosonic Podcast, breaking down the art of engineering and creating lasting experiences through Pro AV. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Fusion, an Electrosonic Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B. And folks, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of the show. We appreciate you listening along to some Electrosonic Thought Leadership. As you're listening, make sure that you're going to our website, electrosonic.com, for more information on our solutions and services and methodologies, but also more Electrosonic content, including podcasts and videos and more. You can also subscribe to Fusion on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Just look up Electrosonic, hit that subscribe button, and you'll have a full catalog of previous episodes as well as notifications when we drop new ones. So on today's episode of Fusion, we're exploring the growing and ever-evolving space of leisure experiences. As the end user's expectation around leisure becomes more dynamic and their focus on innovation and technology becomes more of a a mainstay for the end user, we're going to be breaking down how leisure can become even stronger, more resilient, and more profitable through the usage of technology and innovation with our conversation today titled The Strength of Innovation, Technology at Leisure Businesses in the Past, Present, and Future. So we're going to be grounding our insights today around solutions that Electrosonic has provided to support the development of attractions, museums, and resorts worldwide, while also taking a peek at what is to come so that we can understand where technology is at and how this can support leisure businesses in a highly disrupted era with accelerated technology developments. Now, visitors' expectations in terms of innovation and technology have increased. We dive into the range of solutions that will be there in order to support the leisure industry for decades to come. So, for insights today, we're sitting down with our three thought leaders. Let's start with Giannis Kabolis, Director of Technology Innovation at Electrosonic. Great to have you on, Giannis. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you very much for having me. It's always great to speak to you, Daniel. Yeah, of course. Always a pleasure getting to chat with you. I'm looking forward to another great conversation. We're also inviting Joel Zink, Senior Design Consultant at Electrosonic, on to the conversation today. Joel, great to have you on. How are you doing? Doing very well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Pleasure getting to chat with you today as well. And last but not least, Mr. Ryan Poe, Director of Technology Solutions at Electrosonic. Ryan, great to have you on as well. Thanks, Daniel. All right. So Giannis, Joel, Ryan... So we're going to be breaking down our conversation today into three main parts. First one's going to be on technology during the pandemic. Then we'll take a step back. We'll look at technology before the pandemic. And then finally, we'll look into the crystal ball and speak a bit on technology after the pandemic. All, again, framed around how technology is supporting leisure businesses today. So again, let's start with technology during the pandemic. First question for both of you. Uh, obviously, the last year has been an emotional roller coaster for leisure operators all around the world. So, in your opinions, was technology ready to support parks and operating through this crisis? Yes or no? And where did it shine if it did at all? I think that uh, obviously the pandemic um, found every business, including the leisure business, not fully prepared. Uh, we had uh, the challenge of uh, not only being able to properly social distance, but also uh, uh, be able to track uh, in the unfortunate event of somebody being exposed uh, and let others uh, uh, know that they were within a vicinity. So how we were dealing with uh, simple things uh, in terms of uh, sanitization, uh, but also be able to provide, um, uh, you know, a, a similar experience to what people had before the pandemic uh, actually hit, uh, was extremely challenging. However, um, it's uh, the leisure business and uh, location-based and themed entertainment business are extremely resilient, and I think everyone was working uh, overdrive to uh, be able to come up with solutions which were slowly being implemented uh, try to resolve the crisis. 
Yeah, and I think feeding off of what Giannis was saying too, the had this had this happened probably five or ten years ago, we would have been in in much more dire straits. I'd say a lot of the network capabilities and the way that we're designing systems now to be more resilient, to have uh, the ability to check on stuff remotely, a lot of network based and redundant systems has made it so. Yes, the pandemic's out there. It, it's infecting people, but it's not affecting a lot of the systems that we're using. Yeah, I, I agree with both of you. I think that there was uh, none of us were really prepared for a pandemic at this scale, but um, the organizations that had some of those remote capabilities in place, I think it made it um, a, a little bit easier to minimize on-site staffing and to uh, keep an eye on some of their investment. And even though this whole industry was hit really hard by the pandemic, it seems that parks uh, have been able to remain resilient with solutions of innovation in order to continue to operate during this pandemic. So I'm curious what y'all saw that worked. What are some examples uh, that you've seen of parks quickly adapting, using technologies to get through this challenging time? So that can be anything from, I don't know, queuing solutions to health monitoring solutions, uh, social distanced experiences, non-touch technology. Though I'm just pulling those out of thin air, but, uh, you know, I, I know those do reflect some quality innovative solutions during this time. So again, break down those technologies that you saw work during the crisis and then also connect them with how they've left the industry. What has been the impact over the last year of these solutions? Looking back, the, the solutions that we've seen a lot of uh, emphasis on has, of course, been the, the contactless or touchless systems. Um, a lot of motion tracking, body tracking, uh, even smaller devices with finger tracking. So you're not actually touching screens. There, uh, almost immediately from the design standpoint, we had clients clamoring for how could we do more of this? How is it? How can we do this so that people don't have to be here and then we have to wipe it down every time someone comes through? Um, so we already had a lot of those systems in place, but it's it's accelerated so much faster in terms of not touching screens just for the cleanliness effect and having the number of people come through that would come through a park normally. Um, that has been kind of a lifesaver, and I, I I feel like it's it's probably going to be continuing moving forward, which works well given kind of the the responsiveness that we've had to VR and AR and some of the other um, kind of central uh, concepts that we have to structured cabling and everything else. It's a natural extension to it that I feel like I'm, I'm talking to clients all the time when they, they say, oh, can we... We want to do this idea, the screen here, but can we do it so they don't have to touch it? And that's that's been the biggest one I think I've seen. Yeah, I think um, you know from the the touchless point of view too. Again, a lot of this was just accelerated. I think that's a good word to describe it. And some of the efforts that were going around improving like web and mobile experiences, those allowed for uh, things like e-ticketing or contactless payment, uh, mobile menus inside of restaurants. Um, some some of those efforts that were maybe already in place were um, just kind of accelerated as part of this. Yeah, we're an industry uh, that uh, is, revolves around experience. So I think that uh, uh, the experiential side and the expectation uh, changed a little bit, but uh, they were able to adapt. I also wanted to say that uh, what uh, I think happened also is that a lot of the, the potential visitors would actually start their experience while they're researching or preparing themselves for their visit. So you had also that interaction where technology played a big role as well. And even taking away too, Giannis, along the same lines, when they're they're getting some of the, the digital assets that they're able to take home with them and interact kind of after the fact too has been an increase. It's not just e-tickets and making sure that they're they're preparing before, but when they go home, continuing that experience on a lot of times personal devices, even on the tram ride back to the parking structure, for instance, um, and kind of expanding that beyond kind of the borders uh, on the end and hopefully helping kind of regenerate some additional uh, repeat visits as well based on that. Now, what would y'all say was the biggest challenge that operators faced during this crisis and which were the technologies that best solved those needs during the crisis and connect the dots for us with where that leaves the industry today? Well, I'll just kind of play off what Joel just said around extending the experience and 
staying connected to visitors, even if maybe they were choosing not to visit at a particular moment, but staying connected with them um, through, again, whether it's a mobile application or, or through the website, but um, kind of keeping that constant connection so that when they are ready to go back, it, it feels uh, more seamless than having been away for a long period of time. Yes, I would agree 100% uh, uh, with that as well. It's uh, uh, on the operator side was also uh, the fact that uh, uh, now using remote technology for the supervision portion, troubleshooting, uh, etc., uh, uh, became of a greater need since um, sometimes people could not travel to the site and uh, assist with something that uh, was not working. So uh, that was just another dimension uh, that they had to be um, flexible with and adapt. All right. I feel like that covers pretty well some of the main technologies that were used during the pandemic. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a step back, we're going to rewind, and we're going to look at where the industry was headed technology-wise before the pandemic and try to connect some of the dots between where the industry was headed, how it had to respond during the crisis, and where those two worlds intersect. So, I think a, a a great example of how the leisure business industry uh, had used technology as a core aspect of its immersive experiences is looking at the years on years of world expos from, you know, I mean, centuries uh, ago as well down to, you know, um, more recent ones. But when we look at many of the world expos that we've seen uh, over the years, they are definitely showcasing the forefront of technology development. And for many of these, Electrosonic was actually supporting the design and the build of the technology solution. So I want to take a second to chat on the World Expo side of this. How have these World Expos played a role as uh, drivers for technology development over the years? How important are they? Daniel, they're extremely important. Uh, um I hope I'm not getting my numbers wrong, but I think Electrosonic has uh, contributed in building more than 90 pavilions uh, over the last few decades in various expos. And in every single time, the demands uh, on both the uh, actual physical technology delivered at the site, but also the type of experience uh, that was uh, created by utilizing the technology was always pushing the limits. And uh, in, in this case, as uh, you're very uh, well aware, uh, with the World Expo in Dubai, where we're playing a very large part, um, it, it is no different. Um, the challenges uh, uh have been um, uh, tremendous. Uh, we have managed to pull through, but they have been tremendous, uh, both uh, uh, logistical, uh, but also in terms of um, how in, uh, al although the time, the physical time, the actual timeline has expanded, how it has also collapsed in certain ways because of uh, the, the number of personnel that you can have active, the support that you could even have sometimes um, uh, by vendors. So uh, going uh, everything from how you price things, uh, how you have planned things in terms of the on the operation side, uh, delivering the services uh, was completely different. And uh, again, has been uh, adapting by the use of even uh, uh, additional software tools so you can manage uh, better um, uh, your resources. Uh, but most importantly, um, uh, the people, the resilience of the people is actually what uh, helped us to pull uh, through this. Yeah, I think the expos from a technology standpoint are especially uh, challenging because a lot of times they're being planned, you know, five years in advance, and they're also meant to represent the future. You have technology that's supporting uh, the pavilions, but also part of a showcase. Uh, so bringing that all together, planning it ahead of time, so it's still relevant by the time of the pavilion, or you know, by the time of the expo. Oftentimes they uh, are in existence for a period of time, so keeping that content uh, relevant, I think, is a big challenge as well. Yeah, and moving to from not just uh, kind of spectacles and. Uh 
ones where you walk into a pavilion and you're taking a look at a beautiful set of what was CRT monitors and then projection, projection mapping, but also the increasing uh, need to make it more interactive and more immersive has always been kind of driving it and allowing the visitors to really see a lot of this kind of the cutting edge that was planned so far in advance and actually seeing it come together is is one of the the magics of the expos. And I know that part of the draw of the World Expo over the years has been, like you said, that one-time unrivaled experience. You're getting a showcase of technology that is to come as well as what is innovating today. But I feel like, to some degree, a lot of these experiences, or at least cutting-edge technologies, have been made mainstays across the experience industry, and uh, to some degree with the way that um, technology is proliferated today, folks don't need to go to a World Expo to still get innovative technologies or to see cutting-edge immersive experiences. So do you think that theme parks or uh, even you know less structured, just smaller, individualized, innovative, immersive experiences have taken over or at least are now filling part of the role of the World Expo? Or do they coexist and fill different roles? What are your thoughts there? I think it's a it's an interesting question. The pace of technology, uh, you know, continues to accelerate, and I think that um, parks and leisure environments can be a little bit more uh, nimble and dynamic in terms of um, leveraging some of those technologies compared to an expo. However, I still think there's a place for the expos too, as kind of a um, that snapshot in time. But um, yeah, I think I think the parks are definitely able to be a little bit more dynamic there. Yeah, I'd say they complement each other. Um, a lot of the expos, you're looking at, at at huge installs that are done, that are the big s- spectacles. And then at the same time, a lot of that technology is either simultaneously in design development, or this is a, a showcase for what was cutting edge. And in the leisure uh sector really benefits from that. I know that we've worked on a number of projects that involve components that went from the World Expos and into kind of theme park environments. And back and forth, we were in design for a theme park uh, attraction. And I was like, oh, this is this looks like this will be great and it'll work well and be a very wow factor for the Expo as well. So I think they're really complementary to each other. I agree. Uh, they are very complementary because they're both uh, 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 gravitate uh, based on the experience. It's uh, it, it's one thing to look up technology and maybe have something being served remotely at someone's uh, home, etc. But it's a different thing to experience it at a grand scale with a lot of people, whether that's at an expo or at a dark ride, for example. I mentioned Electrosonic has done a lot of work uh, with these World Expos over the years, but at an even uh, wider level or wider view, Electrosonic has been part of these design, technology, and experience evolutions for over 50 years now. So how has Electrosonic specifically evolved its technologies and solutions to match the growth of the industry? I know that might be kind of hard to summarize over 50 years worth of innovations, but if you have to at least highlight the key ones that really reflect technology innovations and how Electrosonic responded or was proactive about those evolutions, I'd be happy to hear. I'll be happy to uh, take a stab at it first. Um... Uh, technology obviously advances in leaps and in order to keep up uh, you have to uh, do something similar uh, when you're talking about uh, your level of competence uh, your know-how and uh, uh, of course uh, the staffing Uh, apart from that uh, you really need to be a good uh, collaborator and work very closely both with uh, uh, vendors uh, which are trying to produce a product. We have uh, worn that hat as well as being a manufacturer at specific times um, uh, during our this 50 year plus life cycle. Um, so uh, the, the, what, we need, what we do is we're basically looking uh, at um, what is it that is missing? What is it that uh, uh, will create either a wow factor or that uh, either our clients or the visitors uh, need uh, 
And uh, based on that, uh, we're trying to do our research and try to find a good fit between uh, suggestive uh, uh, advancements, uh, whether it's that an exploitation or an exploration of what we're trying to do uh, in a specific uh, platform, and then try to uh, adapt uh, pr by promoting it to the right people um, and uh, uh, respond properly to the creative uh, visions uh, that uh, a specific group, project group has. Yeah, I think, Giannis, you're right. It's been a lot of the collaboration and the role that we've been able to fill um, as being, we have experience on both sides from a manufacturer as well as from a design and consulting uh, standpoint and really helping teams work together. Um, I, I think that's, you see a lot of that in the kind of the, way that projection and projection mapping and warping and blending of images has we've been able to help over the years i think one of the first ones that we did that was kind of a a big projection setup was back in the 1960s um through the 60s and 70s there was just as you said you know, the leaps and bounds of of technology and as projectors have increasingly become larger more powerful with more color color options, wider gamuts. I mean, we've been working with manufacturers to come up with some really creative and really stunning images that are projection, which you may not think of as being projection. It, it's been some very unique uh, setups and just having so many tools to work with and knowing which, which companies to go with and which ones we're helping to produce these big spectacles has made a big difference. So I'm always really impressed with all the, the creative projection stuff that we come up with. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I think if you look at the history of um, uh, technology at Expos in the history of Electrosonic, they're one and the same. I, that's uh, one of the things I was really impressed by. Uh, I'll, I'll do a shameless plug for our first 50 years publication, which is on the website, but it, and it highlights a lot of those um, uh, innovations at the Expos. But it's, it's uh, also just impressive how those two things are aligned. Um, and, and yeah, I think some of the work that's been done with projection from transitions to blending to multi-projection and computers and for, for timing and also for video processing, um, it, it's amazing to see how much of that Electrosonic was kind of at the forefront of. If you each had to pick the company's single most impressive accomplishment during this growth period, so I know that's a tough question, but if you had to get it down to your number one favorite what would it be and why? I think uh, in, in the 84 uh, Expo, there was a 360 degree projection from a single projector. Um, so technically it was very innovative, but it was also innovative from an experience perspective that, that really kind of truly immersive experience. So I think that's one that kind of sticks out for me. I would uh, uh, point out not in terms of a, just a world expo, uh, but in terms of um, uh, a location, the Kennedy Sp uh, Space Center in uh, Florida and uh, some of the work that was done there uh, because it had to be not just innovative, uh, it also had to work really, really well, well with uh, artifacts, which are one-offs, uh, such as the Atlantis Space Shuttle and uh, be able to uh, maintain uh, the narrative, obviously, that uh, NASA had for its uh, artifact, uh, the connections and the stories of all the people that had worked on it over the decades, uh, but also the expectations of the public uh, that uh, were able to be within a few feet from it, uh, something that uh, uh, most of us uh, were never able to do. So I will point at the reveal of the space shuttle as you're going from act two to act three, the pre-show to actually seeing the actual space shuttle and the reveal of it. 
Yeah, although I wasn't at the 1992 <laughs> Expo, um, looking at some of the media and the stuff that came out of it, the uh, I, I think it was the the mixed media show that they had um, in the UK Pavilion, the the video wall that they had. I mean, it would have been it was CRTs at the time. It was something 800 plus video monitors, and it was it was like 30 tons, I think, of equipment, and just the the sheer scale of that we put that together. Um, it was, I think it was 16 meters by 10 meters um, back in the early 90s. That, I mean, just looking back at it, I was like, wow, what an undertaking. That, it's still amazing that we 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 pulled that one off. Nowadays, we wouldn't wouldn't do anything like it. It'd be projection or be direct view LED. But this was CRTs. That was, that's something else. Yeah, LED is similar to what we did at the, the MGM atrium. All right, we're rewinding even further. I'm going to ask you all to pull from your childhood memories a little bit, so maybe give you a second to reboot that uh, that server. Uh, but from your own childhood memories, if you had to look back at what the experience looked like when you were growing up, which technologies are the ones that impressed you most at that time as an observer, as an end user? And are you still seeing those technologies being put to work today in innovative ways? This one's pretty easy for me. Um, the first time I ever heard spatial audio or 3D audio, I was just blown away. Um, I actually don't remember where it was. I just remember it was the uh, the setup where the mosquitoes buzzing around. Um, I th- it may have just been uh, at a local theater, but they had a new sound system installed and just the ability to have that type of spatial audio. I had no idea how they were doing it, but it just sounded so amazing that one of the first things when I started getting on the internet and looking up things was looking up how they did it and went oh, okay and that's something we're still seeing now it's becoming more prevalent that's for sure and it's certainly easier to do with the software and the tools that are now available but i i distinctly remember that mosquito buzzing around and going wow that is that is the coolest thing ever from <laughs> having it where it was, uh, the speakers were directly in front of me or maybe some from behind which i didn't recognize to overhead to the sides having to turn your head and getting a, a very different sense of where that uh, mosquito is buzzing that that's always been been amazing and the the talent that it takes to do some of those mixing well is also just they're artists to be able to do it and i'm glad we're able to have the tools to let that more people experience that i will have to say uh this is in the 60s uh in uh, visiting one of the the eugenides foundation in athens greece and uh their planetarium and looking at the multi-head uh, Zeiss laser projection system uh, where you actually had a full immersive visual experience uh, under a dome. Uh, for me, that was uh, breathtaking. I think for, uh, for me, it was uh, in the early 90s. It was the first time I rode a uh, motion simulator ride. Uh, I think it was based on the uh, Days of Thunder movie, which I don't even know if I'd seen the movie at the time. But um you're really sort of immersed in the story, which is sometimes a little harder to do with like a coaster or a thrill ride. And and so that aspect of it was really interesting to me. And then, you know, a few years later I came back and that ride was something completely different. And it was interesting to see how you could kind of reimagine something by swapping out content and software and, and re- really making it about the story instead of having to physically tear it down and rebuild. I love those stories. That's great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Now, based on what made those technologies cutting edge, do you see current technologies or future technologies having that same sort of tangible impact on the end users of today? And if so, uh, how do you think they stack up? Do you think that is just, I mean, clearly the immersiveness over the last 20 years, it's gotten even more robust. Uh, so to some degree, yes, it's going to be more immersive, kind of a duh question. But um, if you had to compare, you know, what stood out to you when you were finally, you know, getting to experience this as an end user versus end users and the technology they're experiencing today, what are some of the similarities uh, that bridge those technologies together, maybe in their implementation or strategy? Yeah, from the spatial audio 
one, I think that a lot of that that kind of wow factor came out of the fact that I was definitely in a, a darkened theater or more of a uh, theater that had some scenic elements and that the speakers were hidden. And unlike a video wall, although we, we do projection certainly, and there's no wall there until the projector turns on with content, um, hiding speakers and getting kind of the, the smaller form factor speakers, getting some of the newer technologies that can hide speakers and the wall coverings that, that are acoustically transparent so you don't see them. And then suddenly there's audio coming from something is is something that I definitely like, and we're seeing that a lot more, um, wanting to see the speakers less but hear them more. Um, and then the advances in the, the digital signal processing. DSPs just have so much at your fingertips that you can adjust now to do pan around the room, um, move between speaker channels more effectively. Uh, it takes less hardware to be able to do similar or even better effects. So I think continuing that forward, we're going to see a lot more of that um, kind of processing and audio and speaker combination to to add an extra wow factor, whether it's in the primary area that people are in, or even a lot of the waiting rooms or queue lines that we see. Um, gags, audio gags showing up in unexpected locations that are kind of the, a nice little uh, Easter egg, acoustic Easter eggs. I love that comparison uh, that you gave, Joel. Um, I, 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 I want to take it a step further. Um, I, I think that the technology in the future is going to be even more exciting uh, because it's not just specific to something that it's uh, echoic, auditory, or visual, iconic. I think that uh, triggering uh, and creating uh, lasting experiences with um, uh, a technology that is also in all to the AV industry adjacent fields, including materials, including lighting, including environmental conditions. And then taking, for example, the uh, a mixed reality environment, or in, in fact, an extended reality uh, uh, environment and tie that with, just as Joel said, uh, uh, the ability to create force perspective, not only visually because we can paint imagery in all sorts of surfaces, but also create a, an acoustic and auditory force perspective where it captures your attention. Then the immersiveness suddenly can appear in any space. You don't have to go sit in a chair under a dome, as I described earlier, to get that experience. Now it might happen anywhere. Yeah, and I'll, you know, going back to the, um, the motion simulator ride I mentioned, it, it was, um, it, I, I liked the story element of it, but the story was kind of catered to the technology and what the technology could do. I think as we're seeing technology advance, the, the technology can serve the story. Uh, and so the story can really become the focus and the technology kind of falls away in the background. Uh, and, and that's the part that's exciting to me because I feel like that's it's, it's the story that's compelling, not necessarily the technology in and of itself. All right, Giannis, Ryan, Joel, we're getting to our final theme of conversation for the episode today. We're going to be looking into the crystal ball and chatting technology after the pandemic, the technology that will be influencing the experiences of tomorrow. So innovation has always been an incremental part of the attractions industry all over the world. What do you see as the main motivating factors that are going to continue to drive tech innovations in the industry moving forward and why? So the the evolution I'm seeing in a lot of our projects is the, the interactives. I know we, we've touched on it before. Um, Increasingly, the interactives too that people can take home or that are part of the experience that extends beyond the gates or beyond the, the physical properties uh, where all this is happening. Um, I don't see that slowing down. If anything, when people are allowed back into kind of the, the leisure areas, it's going to be accelerated even more. I think we've all had our uh, phones and mobile devices with us so much, they become even more a part of our life that... It, it's going to be natural to have those those devices as part of the experiences that we're having in the years to come as part of these when attractions are going to be reopening. I, I think it's inevitable. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point around the personal devices, phones, wearables, AR implants one day. Um, and, and as the experience is kind of inside of those devices, what's the draw to the park? And I think the park has always been 
the kind of intersection of technology and the built environment. And as that tech, the technology portion becomes sort of more personal, um, I think it'll be software applications that really kind of ties all that together. So I think we'll see a lot um, of innovation on the software side at, at parks. Uh, there will still be dedicated technology, but as our personal vice, devices become more part of the experience, it'll be software that's tying all that together. Yes, I, I agree 100% with both what uh, Ryan and Joel said. Uh, I, I would add to it that uh, it's going to be ever more so uh, data-driven uh, and uh, also customization uh uh, the customization part is what of uh, the personalized experience is what is going to be driving things to the nth degree. And how do you think those motivating factors are going to shape upcoming projects and expansions, whether that's viability for integrating them, any operational challenges, um, you know, technology opportunities? What do you see as the domino effects? I, I would say that uh, uh, Adaptability uh, is the key word uh, on that. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, there are there are certain aspects in the themed entertainment industry uh, which are sort of uh, you know de facto and status quo. Uh, however, there are a lot of other areas uh, which um, uh, you know. Uh, have to be a little bit more adaptable because of the level of experience uh, the uh, the public is now uh, exposed to. I mean, we order food and the experience, right, because of the pandemic has changed 100%. We get cues about when things get into the oven, when they're driving over, and then even the packaging has changed of the same pizza that we used to get, for example. Uh, so all that is, uh, is what uh, is driving uh, the, the future. And uh, more so in the leisure and in the themed entertainment uh, world, because of, as you said, um, uh, it's the, the, the location where both the personalized experience and the environment meet technology. Yeah, and a lot of that that personalization and technology and even flexibility that Giannis was mentioning, there's just there's so much infrastructure that it takes to to accommodate all that and trying to use the crystal ball and figure out, okay, we're going to need whatever the next next flavor or next uh, development in wireless communications is that everyone's going to be carrying around. It's just like the number of IP addresses, how we've run out of them moving to I, the, the V6. I think just all this is kind of snowballing into an infrastructure question and being able to predict where that's going or working with manufacturers or partners to anticipate where that's going and then work towards it so that we can design and develop these type of attractions that that are very immersive it's 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 a sliding scale and it's definitely sliding and it's hard to predict where it's going but i think we're doing a good job of of looking ahead I, I think too, as those experiences get more personalized, uh, security, privacy, um, those things are going to come into play as well. So even if we can technically do it, there's the social aspects to consider, and that will be um, a, a big part of what we do as well as is taking that into account when designing uh, the technology for that that can enable that. So the decade before the pandemic was signed off as one of the eras of the most explosive growth that we've seen for key leisure operators, which allowed for a ton of new technology immersion to find its way to the parks. What are some quality examples that you've seen of upcoming developments that could push the limits of what parks can offer their guests moving forward? Well, I'll just kind of keep playing on that personalization theme. I mean, you you can really start to um, actually tie a lot of the technologies we, talk, we talked about. So the personalization, the augmented reality, mobile applications, all those can kind of come together uh, to create those personalized experiences, which could be, um, you know, wayfinding through the park, seeing park information overlaid uh, at, at different attractions, gamification elements. There's, I think, uh, a lot of exciting things you can do there. 
along similar lines the, to the scavenger hunts too that we're seeing with the AR and VR uh, and customizing of those based on a person's profile and what information they're sharing too uh, can be kind of the, the new up and coming kind of pushing those limits. And I wanted to add to all that, that the, that customization and personalization, perhaps it's not just for the visitors. It's also for the operators. It's also for the way they can uh, evil, uh, because things will break, troubleshoot something eventually. And the 10 years before the pandemic, having that key growth for the industry obviously enabled a lot of these technologies we see today. But we're now coming off the heels of a year of the opposite, uh, a a lull on expansion and growth for every industry, definitely including leisure business and the uh, experience industry. So do you think we're going to be able to see that same kind of growth over the next 10 years at least? Um, basically, do you think we can pick up the pace again? Can we get back in that flow of consistent growth or are we going to have to pause and reevaluate? Absolutely. I think uh, we will. I think that um, uh, although maybe the, we did not build as many attractions as we did uh, in the years prior to the pandemic, um, uh, technology, how, however, has continued to advance. It hasn't stopped. In fact, certain areas have accelerated more so now than ever before. And uh, they they are uh, uh, as I like to say. Uh, once you know all the rules, you know what the visitors want. We you know what the park operators want. You know what the creative teams have uh, uh, as a vision, and you put all that together, and then you know all the rules of the technology. Then it's easier to predict what to break to create a magic and then that magic is even uh, more advanced and more profound uh, than anything in the past which is gonna have people uh, lining up to come uh, and see and experience this because uh, we are as uh, humans that type uh, of creature we like to experience things together as groups and uh, get excited. I agree. Um, I think there's a lot of, uh, or I hope at least there's a lot of pent up demand and we're heading into a new roaring 20s and hopefully that is a catalyst for, um, you know, innovation and um, new technologies in these spaces. Yeah, and I would say, although they haven't been building physically a lot of, a lot of things during the pandemic, we've certainly been very, very involved and very busy in terms of designing and coming up with the ideas, knowing that it's going to be the shovels ready as soon as, as soon as everything is kind of opened up to jump back in. And a lot of thought and a lot of uh, creative ideas have come out of us all having to work from home and thinking of things slightly differently than what we would have before. And I think it's going to be a lot of really great ideas and things that people are really wanting to get out get away from home for a little bit and really experience. To stick with the effects of COVID as we wrap up our conversation today, the current crisis has once again accelerated technology implementation in our daily lives. So for all the ways that it put a lull and a pause on several aspects of uh, the experience industry, it has normalized a lot of other technologies and I think made end users more uh, willing to branch out and try digital, mobile, or online experiences. And I think this will, without a doubt, have an impact on how technology will be evolving as part of uh, an experience at a broader attraction. So keeping in mind where technology is at today, how do you think this scenario, this Petri dish of different factors, is going to shape the type of solutions that we're going to see in the coming years? I think uh, that... Uh... Uh, again, uh, back to the personalization and uh, having access to data and information. Uh, this, uh, both yourself, the end user, but also the provider of the service or uh, uh, let's say the operator of uh, a site, uh, an attraction, uh, is going to be playing, it has been uh playing already a role, but it's going to continue to advance. And um, if anything, I uh, what has been proven is that as that uh, 
becomes more of um, a, a wider used aspect of the technology, uh, cost goes down and we can uh, uh, get that kind of exposure uh, on other situations. For example, you're taking a beautiful road trip and you're passing through a national park and now you can take out your phone and perhaps get information uh, using augmented reality uh, about your surroundings. Um, you were not able to do that uh, a few years ago. Uh, that has only advanced. So I think that um, all this is going to continue playing a role and uh, uh, accelerate in, uh, in certain ways uh, some of the results and implementation deployment and uh, implementation of technology. Yeah, I think you're right, Giannis. I, I, it, it's coming back to the personalization and combining that with kind of larger spectacles of AR and VR and, and the ability to distribute that. More people are going to be able to consume that. And I think in the leisure industry, we're going to benefit from, from, from that and from the way that we've partnered with with other other individuals and other groups to help develop that even further because everyone's it seems like everyone's got a smartphone now and everyone has the ability and they're expecting great things and customized to what they want and that's i think that's a, a great path for us to to go in and it's it, it's really going to add to uh, the national park was a great one add to that experience of something you would not have thought of before i wouldn't have thought of before playing my phone but yeah you you're there you're in in the space and time and this adds that new dimension of personality on top of it yeah i think it's an expanded toolkit that we're working with i think some of those applications to make um a lot of this more accessible to more people i think that will be um appealing as well as we move forward all right. One last question for y'all. Do you see any shift in the way that operators are going to have to implement this technology? Uh, for instance, is there a trend in uh, evolving from immersive technology towards technologies that are more focused on operational efficiency, especially as a lot of businesses uh, still reel from some of the budget cuts and budget bottom line crunches that came from COVID. So yeah, are you seeing any uh, changes in how these operators are going to implement technology in these experiences? And if so, uh, how do you see these various worlds intersecting? Yeah, I think we'll continue to see a shift towards standardization of hardware and protocols. And, and that doesn't mean that we can't be creative within that and we can't apply them in unique applications. Um, but I think a lot of organizations see the operational value in having some consistency across their technologies, having remote access to it, um, you know, having uh, similar devices that are, um, you know, for when they have a, a break fix scenario, being able to keep spares, things like that. So I think we will see some more standardization, but hopefully not, um, you know, at, not at, uh, it doesn't diminish the creativity that's involved. Yeah, the remote support, I think, is what I'm seeing in a lot of my designs, too, where before it was something that was uh, nice to have. And we would normally encourage it and and to talk to the end clients and the projects about the the really the benefits of it and i think if anything the pandemic has really come with the standardization that ryan was talking about as well as that ability to support people remotely because we're all working remote already and i think that that's probably going to be something that sticks around a lot in terms of operations for a lot of these areas i agree with both uh, uh, joel and ryan what they had to say uh, I, I need to add, uh, I think, the fact that this this standardization, which is more like platforms communicating over uh, other platforms uh, of technology, uh, what they create on the backside is uh, uh, a lot of data sharing. And uh, that data sharing is extremely important. Um, uh, we use data acquisition to make sure that uh, QC over an assembly line is correct. Well, now we can use that finally to make sure that uh, large deployments operate well. And then as uh, both Ryan and Joel said, is that uh, remote 
management, supervision, uh, and so forth is uh, something that we will encounter a lot more. But that does not mean that creativity uh, is going to not become, uh, uh, not have higher requirements and it will be kind of uh, bland and the same. No. And on that note, I think that does it for our conversation today. Thank you so much to all three of you for breaking down how you see the leisure business industry, the experience industry evolving coming out of the pandemic, some of the historical markers that might give us indicators for how the technologies that influence this industry will continue to evolve, and what you look forward to coming out of the industry moving forward. So again, thank you to all three of our guests, Giannis Kabolis, Director of Technology Innovation, Joel Zink, Senior Design Consultant, and Ryan Poe, Director of Technology Solutions, all three with Electrosonic. And if folks want to find out more about some of the technologies and uh, innovative solutions we talked about today, how can they do so? Please visit uh, the Electrosonic website. Uh, it's organized in, uh, in a way that provides you with uh, insights and um, uh, information about uh, what we do, things that we're engaged in, uh, some uh, projects which might be relevant, uh, have relevant information with things that you're looking for, and uh, uh, give you ways of contacting us directly. Yeah, electrosonic.com is the, the best resource to go to, to to take a look and especially check out some of the recent projects that we've done. There's some fascinating stuff that we've been really excited to be a part of. Fantastic. Thanks to all three of you. Looking forward to future conversations. Thanks again. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening to today's episode of Fusion, an Electrosonic podcast. If you like what you heard and want to listen to previous episodes, make sure that you're going to our website, electrosonic.com, as well as subscribing to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B. Till next time. Bye.